So uh, Marius and, and uh, Adrian are actually researchers now in the confidential computing uh, team in, in Cambridge. Uh, but interestingly, um, they were PhD students on a Swiss GRC project uh, beforehand. And that's what they will be reporting on today. Uh, so the past project was uh, with Ed uh, Bunion, um, and uh, there is a new project as well uh, with also Matthias Paya, and both of these uh, will be covered now in the talk that Marius and Adrian are given. And uh, then Marius has kindly agreed to chair the rest of the session this morning on confidential computing. Over to you, Marius, and I can uh, do the jumping off. Great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction, Scarlett. It, it's so nice to be back in person and having this event, so thank you for organizing all this. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Marius Kogas, and I'm a researcher at Microsoft Research in Cambridge. Uh, before that, I was a PhD student at, at TPFL, and today with my colleague Adrian Gosson, we're going to uh, talk to you about two different uh, Swiss ARC projects. Uh, the first one was a, about a project that I did as a PhD student, and uh, the next one is now a project that um, I'm, I'm supporting uh, the project as, as the Microsoft endpoint. Uh, so it will be both of an overview of what happened in the past uh, and uh, also an introduction to what we plan to do in the future. So the, the title of this presentation is Building Data Center Applications with Latency and Confidentiality Guarantees. So um, we, uh, we are systems people, we build infrastructure and specifically um, data center infrastructure. So let's start with data centers and try to understand why data centers can be a challenge as, um, as, uh, to, to systems researchers. And the way you should see the data center is that it's just the other end of your smartphones. So whenever you uh, access the network, you do, uh, use social media, do web searches, um, there are some requests that end up inside uh, huge building filled with servers, there's some processing uh, taking place there, and then you get back a response. And um, the data center is particularly interested, interesting if you think about um, th the amount of electricity that, that we spent inside the data center. So there was a recent study at the Science Magazine showing that 1% uh, of world's electricity is consumed in the data center, and uh, the uh, projection for the future show a 2 to 3x increase in the, in the next five uh, years. So you see that, uh, it's, it's quite important we put a lot of resources and we consume a lot of resources in, inside the data center. So where does this electricity go and where do we uh, burn these kilowatts? Uh, in terms of the infrastructure that we have in the data center, it's not pretty complicated. So, so we have um, a lot of commodity servers, 10 to uh, 100,000 servers, interconnected with fast uh, Ethernet-based networking. Uh, in, not fancy topologies, we have just a closed topology for people coming from more uh, high performance computing. And we see more and more emerging hardware uh, in the data center to accelerate workloads such as machine learning, given that we are part of uh, AMLD today, or other workloads. You see um, programmable devices attached to the network. So um, there is this emerging thread of, uh, of loading functionality to. Uh, to these new programmable devices. And the very interesting aspect around the data center that makes it particularly interesting for, for systems research is that a data center is a single administrative domain. This means that there is one company that controls every aspect of the data center from how they build the actual building and how you can do uh, cooling, for example, for the machines, all the way up to the hardware and the software stack. And this gives us a lot of opportunity for vertical integration and cross-stack specialization. So uh, we have a lot of freedom to design both the hardware and the software for the particular applications that run inside the data center. And this makes us particularly happy as systems researchers because we have this freedom. We have many building blocks to, to, to play with. Now, if we take a look at what runs on top of this infrastructure, uh, and, uh, and specifically the workloads, we can see that there are two main paradigms there. On the one hand, we talk about data center services, and these are services such as web search or uh, social networking, so Facebook or Twitter. Uh, and these are services that are run by, the, by the, the companies that run the data centers. And on the other hand, we have the public cloud. So, 
the public cloud where, where people can uh, get resources uh, from, from these cloud providers. And obviously, as systems builders, we have the generic requirements that we want to build systems that uh, have high throughput, so they serve a lot of requests per second. They, they serve this request under low latency, so they're very responsive. And they do that efficiently, so they use the available resources in, in the best possible way. But now, if we dive in in uh, each of these two workload ca categories, we can see that we have an extra level of requirements uh, when we uh, build systems. And when we start with uh, data center services, we care about uh, building systems with low tail latency, so not just uh, average tail latency. This means that we want to build systems that um, are responsive ac across the latency distribution, uh, no matter what, what happens uh, in the data center. This enables us to build these systems with certain uh, levels of quality of service, so people that use these uh, systems uh, can get certain level of guarantees that these systems will, will perform well, and these guarantees are expressed in the form of, of service level objectives. A typical service level objective can be that a specific service replies under a certain latency threshold uh, in the 99th percentile of cases. The other specific requirement when we have when we look at, uh, public, at the public cloud is what Cedric talked about before, and this is confidentiality. So we want to be able to run workloads in the public cloud uh, and make sure that, that the, the cloud provider does not get access to our data when they're in transit, when, uh, the, the, when, when we process them. So uh, in, in the two projects that we worked on, first we focused on the extra requirements that we have in, in the data center services, and this, have to, uh, this uh, has to do with uh, latency critical applications. And in the next, uh, this upcoming project, we focused on uh, confidentiality. So for, for the rest of the talk, first I'm gonna talk about uh, the, the, the old project focusing on, on tail latency for microsecond scale remote procedure calls that was funded in, in the previous uh, Swiss GRC round. And then my colleague Adrian is gonna talk about uh, Taiki uh, that focuses on confidential computing and how we can do that on, on existing hardware. So uh, le uh, this project, the, the, the previous project focusing on tail latency started uh, when I, I went for an internship uh, in, in MSR Redmond in 2022, uh, 2018, and I met my, my mentors there, Irene uh, and Dan, and uh, we figured out that we work on similar topics, so we, we thought that we should uh, submit a proposal for the Swiss JRC. And the problem we, we wanted to, uh, to deal with is to build microsecond scale and tail torrent uh, data center systems. So let's try to, to break this down. Problem, problem number one is why, are, why do we care about microsecond scale computing and, and what changes? The situation is that we have faster and fast, faster I.O. devices that um, have access latencies in the scale of microseconds, and existing systems have not been designed uh, with these requirements in mind. So we need to revisit operating systems and networking mechanisms in order to keep up uh, with uh, the ever-increasing I.O. devices. The second problem has to do with uh, tail tolerance. This means that we need to build systems that consistently perform well and they're responsive across the, the latency distribution, across the different latency percentiles. And this is particularly interesting for data center systems given the kind of communication patterns that, that we have in, in this application. So whenever we send a request to, to do um, a, a web query or whenever we, we access our Facebook wall, uh, this ends up in many, many different requests in the data center and the responsiveness that we perceive as, as, um, as, as, as clients is only affected by the slowest of these requests. So if, even if only one out of 100 requests is particularly slow, this will end up affecting the quality of experience that we have as, as users in, in most of the cases. So we need to build these applications in a tail tolerant manner. And you might ask, okay, is this really a problem? Uh, first of all, as I said, 
uh, this significantly impacts the, the quality of user experience. And different companies have run different studies that this shows how, uh, how the quality of uh, user experience translates to uh, the revenue stream and um, uh, how it affects how engaged the, the users are. But also, if we can build this kind of uh, applications from, from the data center operator operator's point of view, we can run the data center in a more efficient way. We can consolidate uh, applications better and use uh, the available resources in, in a better way. So I'm not going to, I had the chance to talk about specifically the, the different contributions that we had uh, in, in this project during the, the, the previous uh, workshops. So I would like to give a high level overview of what we did over the course of this uh, two, three years. So when we started looking at this problem, uh, specifically looking at microseconds, we realized that we didn't have the available tool set to, to do this kind of research. So the first thing we did is that we built a tool to ef efficiently and accurately measure uh, microsecond scale latencies and uh, be able to, to, to quantify how well existing systems performed. So we entered a, a, a new um, systems research domain. We needed to build the appropriate tools, and we used these tools to characterize what was there already. The next thing we did after we identified what's wrong with existing systems and existing abstractions is to try and propose new abstractions. And as I said, we focused on data center communications and how different data center services talk to each other. And um, the main unit of communication there is remote procedure calls. This is a kind of interaction where you have requests and, and replies. And what we did is that we designed a new transfer protocol specifically targeting this communication pattern. So we designed a transfer protocol for data center communications that exposes this request and response abstraction uh, to, to, to the machines in the, in the data center and also enforces, uh, enables in-network policy enforcement. This means that now uh, we, we can start thinking how we can reorganize our data center applications so that we can en enforce policies inside the network. After we design these new abstractions, then we start thinking how we can unlock new functionality and what we can do with these abstractions, and how can we start integrating emerging hardware to accelerate what, what we can do with these abstractions. And the first thing we did there was to look at consensus and see how we can integrate consensus inside this new transfer protocol and then how we can accelerate consensus uh, using uh, emerging hardware and specifically programmable switches. Or another functionality that we looked at is how can we do admission control using these programmable switches entirely in the network without changing the, the application logic. And once we do that, uh, it's time to uh, retrofit what we learned uh, in existing transfer protocols and existing systems that are out there that um, will make our research much more easy to uh, deploy and much more easy to, to reach out to, to, uh, to uh, existing infrastructure. And what we did is we tried to retrofit some of the findings that we had with RTP2 to, uh, to TCP, and, uh, this had, um, and uh, we had a contribution on how we can do layer four load balancing inside the data center. So uh, now I would like to do a summary of the contributions, and always it's, it's very easy to, to brag about what we did in the past, uh, especially when, it, when things went well. Uh, but uh, during the, the course of this, uh, this project, we uh, were quite happy to, to uh, publish th th these papers. Uh, we had uh, four different papers in uh, top research venues and one workshop publication. And we also got um, a few awards for, for this. Um, First, we, we got the uh, Best Student Paper Award at Eurosys 2020, and we also had, um, this project was more or less the major part of my, my thesis work, and my thesis also uh, got a few awards, to, so it got the Dennis Ritchie uh, Dissertation Award and uh, the Roger uh, Needham Honorable Mention. So, yeah, it was quite a fruitful collaboration, and things went pretty well. Um, so, before I finish, I would like to do a retrospect on a few things that went well and a few things that uh, could have uh, gone better. Uh, and this is what we are trying to, to improve in this uh, new uh, project. So, things that went well. Uh, first of all, we had the freedom to work on many different topics. As, as you saw, we had a contribution in networking, we had a contribution in distributed systems. So, 
uh, we, we had the opportunity to, to span out on, on different uh, research directions. Um, we had the access to new hardware and we, we had the opportunity to experiment with uh, this new, new hardware and try to think how we can uh, use this hardware for data center applications. Uh, another thing that worked pretty well is that both me and Adrian now moved to, to Microsoft and we have continuing collaborations both uh, with, with the MSR colleagues, but also with uh, the MSR colleagues from, from Redmond beyond the, the, the scope of, this, uh, of this, pro this project. Now, to the slightly more, uh, more awkward part that we, with things that didn't work that well or things that we, we could improve. So when we started this project, we had a very concrete plan in mind with what we wanted to do. And when we submitted the research proposal, we, we had the specific milestones in mind. These milestones didn't really come after negotiation or after uh, back and going back and forth with, with the mentors that we had from, from the MSR side. And because we did that, then um, we were not very close with, with our mentors. Um, we, we talked every once in a while. Uh, we met at conferences, but this didn't have a direct impact on what we are going to do next. And unfortunately, this led that uh, we didn't have a common publication with them as part of the Swiss JRC project. Uh, we had the common publication with them afterwards as part of uh, research collaborations, but not as part of the, the Swiss JRC project. And the other thing that uh, we, we could improve as well is that there was no instant or direct interest from the Microsoft endpoint uh, with regards to what we did as part of this project. And it, it's kind of uh, interesting that other companies approached us about what, what we worked on and they were interested in integrating what we built just by going through the papers while we had some issues uh, to, to do that within Microsoft. And this is definitely that something that we're trying to, to improve uh, in, the, in, in this uh, upcoming project. Before we move to the next one, do you have any questions that you would like to ask? Questions from Marius? Uh, hello, uh, this is Girai from ETH Zurich. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, uh, I, I'm curious about your perspective. Uh, how you find uh, the emerging uh, process, processing near memory kind of products uh, in the perspective of uh, reducing energy consumption, achieving high performance in your cloud systems? Like maybe namely, uh, there's this film DRAM from Samsung approaching the market and also uh, there's this French startup Upmam. So they, they uh, claim to provide a lot of benefits. How do you see uh, adoption of these products in your systems? That's a great question. I don't have personal experience with, with these new technologies. I can, I can give you my perspective uh, uh, from, from uh, the perspective of in-network compute and, and programmable switches. So um, I, I think it's, it's very important to, to get access to, to, to hardware and start experimenting with them. And then it becomes a, a question of how you, be, you split your application to take advantage of this, of this uh, new emerging hardware. Uh, it's always a, a matter of uh, designing the right abstractions to, that, that will enable you to, to split functionality in, in the right way. Uh, but um, doing one thing at a time, getting access to hardware and start experimenting with them, building the abstractions, and then uh, trying to uh, retrospect on the lessons learned based on that, it, I, I think is, is, is the right way to go. Um, so I don't know how much time we have left, so maybe I'm going to have to uh, go fast, right? So I'm just going to give a... Ten minutes. Ten minutes? Okay. Uh, okay, should work. I'm going to talk... Um, it's going to be a teaser, basically, for this new project that we're starting um, as a collaboration between Microsoft and uh, EPFL. And it's called Taiki, Confidential Computing on Yesterday's Hardware. Um, I think Cedric gave a pretty good overview of what confidential computing is, so I'm going to go fast uh, over the motivation. So you have some organizations that I chose at random, of course, uh, that can generate very sensitive, but also very valuable data. And I'm not a data scientist, so I don't know what to do with this data, but this building is filled with people that actually have a lot of talent and could use this data to, for example, 
I don't know, uh, help manage a worldwide pandemic, for example. Um, and so we want to give this data, we want to give access to this data to these people so that they can uh, come up with valuable insights. The problem is that the world is not as simple as this slide. It's not just your application written in Python floating in the air. Your application is actually executing on top of the, an operating system that gives it uh, a file abstraction so that you can access the data, a network connection so that you can communicate between different nodes. And actually, all of you know that you're not running this workload on your small, um, cheap laptop, right? You need powerful machines to support your workload. So usually what you do is you're gonna rent a machine in the cloud so that you can get access to very beefy hardware to support your workload. Now the problem is, if you start thinking about who can access your data, um, you start having an issue. Of course, your application has access to this sensitive private data, but also the operating system, the hypervisor, and of course, um, administrators of the cloud. And this is basically too many people. So as Cedric was saying before, um, it used to be that you either had to give up on using cloud services and you had to invest thousands of dollars into building your own infrastructure, or you had to change um, projects and do something else. Now, thankfully, hardware people were nice enough to come up with some solutions for, for us uh, called Trusted Execution Environments, TEs for short. And they come in different flavors. For example, Cedric talk, talked about um, Intel SGX, so Enclaves, which is basically a hardware feature that allows you to guarantee the confidentiality and integrity of your application code and data. And this is great, right? But at the same time, um, it requires you, as the app developer, to take into account the fact that now you're interacting with an operating system that you cannot trust. So you need to implement defensive programming mechanisms uh, whenever you interact with the operating system, which is basically all the time. So you also have other hardware manufacturers that came up with other abstractions, which are confidential VMs. This time you don't change your application, you just deploy it inside a virtual machine on top of an operating system that you trust, um, and everything should work right. But suddenly you increased your trusted code base, computing base, uh, to an entire operating system. And this was basically the question that Edouard uh, had before. Uh, you have a lot of code that's potentially bogus that can leak your data. And then you have yet another programming abstraction provided by yet another hardware manufacturer, which is basically you partition your resources between two worlds, the secure world and the unsecured one. So this is great, right? right? You have uh, multiple uh, options. You have different programming abstractions um, for confidentiality. The problem is that they're all provided by different hardware manufacturers. And as Marius said, I just started working for Microsoft, so I kind of need to think about the issues that Microsoft has. And as a cloud service provider, well, the first question is, which one should we buy? Because if we invest in one of these technologies, we're kind of trapped with one programming abstraction. So enclaves, for example, or just confidential VMs. The second uh, issue is, how many of them do you buy? Is the goal to have everything become conf confidential computing in the end? I think so. So that means that you need to replace your entire fleet of servers at some point. And then how fast can you deploy them? And that, again, relates to what Cedric was saying. Uh, it's not just enough to buy the hardware and install it. You need to come up with all the um, middle software that you're going to use to safely expose these technologies to the cloud clients. So with this current research project, uh, we try to come up with an answer to all of these complicated questions. And our answer is basically do not buy any of them. Uh, we actually have everything we need with current hardware, and we can actually do a lot better than this expensive hardware with what we have right now. And what do we mean by better? Uh, we actually mean that we can treat trust as a sole notion, not as a binary one that is either trusted or not trusted. We can support any of the programming abstractions that I introduced before, and we can also do something that hardware cannot do, which is combine these programming abstractions together, meaning that you can have an enclave inside a confidential VM, inside another confidential VM, inside an enclave if you want to. And how do we do that? Well, what we did is basically we took a step back and started thinking about the problem. So we went back to our systems class. Um, so I'm guessing many people here took a systems class. So the CPU is kind of simple. You have two modes. You have normal mode and super mode. The super mode is where the most privileged software is actually executing, and its role is supposed to be to configure the underlying hardware resources and safely manage and expose them to less privileged software. So for example, if I have memory, I have three pages of memory, my most privileged software is going to decide to take the orange page and make it available to the first application that I have. 
And the most privileged software actually does that in parallel for, for multiple applications. For example, I take the white page and I give it to my second application. And this is basically what we call isolation because none of these apps can access the memory used by the other app, right? Now, what's the less privileged software? As I said, it can be an application, but nowadays it's actually, it can actually be an application running inside an OS or an application running inside an OS on top of a hypervisor, which itself runs on top of another operating system. So when you design systems and the way in which we design systems um, actually follows certain rules. So every encompassing compartment is actually managing and exposing resources to the one that is nested inside of it. So for example, if my OS number two has three pages, it can decide to uh, let the nested VM hypervisor use two of these pages, which in turn can decide to let the nested operating system inside of it use only one of these pages. And the assumption that we had for the past few decades was that trust was flowing the other way around, meaning that every client had to trust its resource manager, the operating system uh, that uses the white page needs to trust the hypervisor, the VM, with unrestricted access to the white page. And the problem that we have with confidential computing is that we don't want trust to flow that way. What we want is for the white page, for example, to be only accessible by the OS. Now, if we forget a little bit about super mode and only consider normal mode, this is not really hard to do. This is something that we do all the time. This is basically the previous slide. What we want is to isolate this compartment from all the others. And this is something that we know how to do. The only thing that we don't know how to do in current, uh, on current hardware is how to not trust the most privileged software. This is the way in which our current hardware is built. The most privileged software has unrestricted access to hardware resources, so we are, we are forced to trust it. And the whole problem that we have with confidential computing nowadays is that who's the most privileged software? It's the hypervisor, for now. So if we summarize the issue that we have with confidential computing, we need to trust the most privileged software running on the machine. The most privileged software running on the machine currently is the hypervisor, and we cannot trust the hypervisor. So what's the easy solution? Well, deprivilege the hypervisor. Make it so that the hypervisor is not the most privileged software running on the machine anymore. So this is the old model. This is currently what's running on the cloud, right? You have your entire stack of nested VMs and application and operating systems. And in super mode, you have the cloud service uh, hypervisor. We give up uh, this model and we do something completely different, which is exactly the same thing. You have exactly the same stack, except that now you have the hypervisor that also runs in normal mode. And now what runs in super mode is Taiki. And Taiki is not a hypervisor. It's a very small monitor whose sole job is to implement um, a very narrow API for memory isolation. And specifically what, what it allows you to do is um, implement isolation at any level of this stack. So it's trying to preserve two guarantees. Whatever compartment is in charge of managing resources retains its prerogative so it can still decide to allocate pages and reclaim them. So this is what I have here. The operating system decides which page it should allocate to the app. But we can also let the app uh, ask Taiki to make this page confidential, meaning that the application should be the only one accessing uh, this page. So the way in which we, okay, the way in which we plan to implement Taiki is, so yeah, one question that you might have is, why would you trust Taiki when you were not trusting the hypervisor? Well, the goal is for Taiki to be trusted by both the cloud service provider and the client, and for that, we want to have a formal uh, verification of the code that we're gonna, um, that we're gonna implement. Um, and we, this code is actually quite simple, as I said before, it basically implements a negotiation protocol between a resource manager and a client. It's basically a piece of software that is going to make sure that a resource manager and a client agree on which resources should be allocated to the client and with which access right and enforces that with the hardware configuration. We also um, are currently looking into how to formalize this approach. Uh, we want to take the formal requirements for virtualization by Popek and Goldberg, it's a very old seminal paper, and extend it to show that we can come up with minimal formal requirements for trusted execution by extending this theorem. Then, on the hardware side of things, we're trying to implement it with as 
few hardware features as possible, so basically community hardware. Um, we want to leverage TPM, which is quite uh, popular, um, to, to implement attestation and be able to safely measure that Taiki is the only privileged software running on the machine. Uh, we might consider memory encryption if we think that physical uh, attacks are, um, are part of the threat model. And of course, because we want performance, uh, we're gonna gradually start using hardware features uh, to make our um, prototype run faster and eventually, potentially, submit a bunch of suggestions on how to build actual hardware that we can use to efficiently implement um, confidential computing. I think that's it. I managed to do it super fast, right? Okay, good. Excellent talk. Thank you very much, Adrian. That's great. Um, yeah, so let's start with the question here. Hey, uh, my name is David. I've got one small question. Um, it's about the, the new model that you were proposing where the app is running in an isolated mode uh, from the operating system and the hypervisor. What if you have an app which accesses for example, custom hardware or something like that, and you have to write a driver which interfaces this hardware, how do you isolate the memory between the application and the operating system which has to run the driver either in user or kernel mode? So that's the thing. So what we're, um, what we're trying to come up with is not full isolation. That's why I, I, I talked about a subtler notion of uh, trust in the sense that basically we will allow you to uh, compose compartments as you wish. If you want to make a page completely private within an application, you can. If you want to share memory, you can. So it's going to be a game of whatever memory, shared memory you're using to communicate between your application, the driver, and the operating system will have to be configured as being shared. Which, which is a huge improvement over uh, current technologies. So one of the main motivations for your encryption is to protect against uh, rebooting or resetting attacks. Yeah. Do you have a way of guaranteeing that uh, TK is going to be booted again if you restart the system, or do you so that's you know, the hardware tweak? You scrub everything, or what's the so that's why we want to catch? Yeah, so, yeah. so that's why we want to leverage TPM basically to measure uh, the boot sequence, make sure that TK is correctly loaded and the only software running there. Uh, the assumption, so I, I can understand that TPM is actually hardware, so uh, it kind of you could think that it would contradict what I, what I said in the beginning, the fact that we don't want to use a uh, specific hardware. But the fact is that now TPM is quite common in the, in the data center. You basically have one attached to almost every server or every rack uh, because it's used internally um, to uh, uh, manage whatever uh, deployment you have on the, on the mission as well. So we kind of want to leverage that to measure the boot, make sure the take is correctly initialized, and use that also as part of the attestation. This is going to be part of the proof uh, that you send to a remote client to guarantee that the, the machine was correctly, that they're executing on top of a, a good machine, properly configured machine. So, so you can check that TIC is properly running based on the TPM, but I don't think you can prevent, the TPM can prevent running something else. Uh, to no, it, after reboot, no. no it, uh, it cannot. But then you wouldn't have a proper um, measurement uh, at the time where you deploy your application, right? Okay. <laughs> we can, uh, we can uh, talk about this in, two, in more detail. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. It was super interesting. Uh, two questions, actually. The first one and it sounds great. When is it uh, available? And uh, the second is, uh, how do you prevent uh, all of this uh, to become a configuration nightmare? Uh, I didn't hear the... Uh, how do you prevent all of this to become uh, just a... Uh, a configuration nightmare. You yes, mean? exactly. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's the point. So we're trying to implement things in, in a way that it would be mostly transparent to anyone who doesn't want to use these specific features and just enable them for uh, people who are interested into having confidential uh, compartments inside their applications or making their full VM um, confidential. The way we are thinking about it is to with the implementation that we have in mind right now, it would be just a question of uh, having the right uh, um, shim layers uh, around your virtual uh, machine or around your application. So it would be mostly transparent to the person that's trying to use them. Okay, thank you very much, Adrian. Thanks. And uh, Mario, as well.